Welcome to Kingdom Life Seminar, Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus. Today's meditation is titled Face to Face, a study in the power of personal revelation. And the text, the first text is taken from Psalm 103, verse 7, where it says, He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. The Bible tells us that there was a difference, a clear difference between Moses and the children of Israel. Moses knew his ways, but all the children of Israel knew were his acts. They could see the outworking of God. They could see his miracles, his signs, his wonders, his power. But Moses actually developed personal knowledge of God, personal intimacy with God. He got to know God so well that the psalmist says that Moses knew the ways of God. And <clears throat> the, the backdrop for this is an interesting story from, from, from the law, from the law which Paul speaks about in the New Testament. But if you go with me quickly to Exodus chapter 19, <clears throat> this is God bringing the children of Israel to Sinai, to Mount Horeb. Sinai in the Bible is a place of personal revelation. Mount Horeb is described in the Old Testament as the mountain of God. And here we see the Lord saying in, in Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6 and 7 to 25, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me, above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came, and called for the elders of the people, and laid before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, and believe you forever. And he goes further and gives instructions for this encounter. And he says, set bounds for the people all around, saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, for he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. <clears throat> and there's quite a bit of a dramatic account about how they needed to listen for the sound of the trumpet before they came to the edge of the mountain. And they got instructions to be sanctified, to wash their clothes, to obtain from physical intimacy with their spouses. And it says, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. So this was God coming to meet with the people with fire, with thunder, with quaking, with the sound of the trumpet, with smoke. And of course, all those who were in the camp trembled in fear. 
And the people witnessed, in Exodus 20 it goes on to say, the people witnessed the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when they saw it, they trembled and stood far. And then they said to Moses, hmm, this is your God. You speak with us, we will hear. But don't let God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. God wants to show himself in his power so that his fear may be in your hearts to keep you from sin. But the people said, hey, this is your God. You go and talk to him. Whatever he tells you, come and tell us. We will do. But as for us, let us stay far from this God that can kill us. This God has fire. He has thunder. He has lightning. He has smoke. The whole mountain is trembling. So the people stood far, afar off, but Moses drew near to thick darkness where God was. Moses drew near to the place of encounter with God. Moses drew near to the place of intimacy with God. Moses drew near to the place where he could be face to face with God, where he could have a personal revelation of God. What the people of Israel were saying to Moses, what the children of Israel were saying to Moses was, you go and have the encounter. You go and speak to God face to face. As for us, we are happy with second-hand revelation. We are happy to be once removed from God. We are happy to be the grandchildren. You be the child of God. We are happy to be grandchildren. But God doesn't want grandchildren. God doesn't have grandchildren. Moses came to the place of encounter. Moses was willing to do what was required to be face to face with God. And in that process, between Exodus 19, when this whole story starts, and Exodus 34, where it ends with the story that Paul tells us in the New Testament, we see Moses having secret encounters, having these intimate encounters where God is revealing secrets about himself to Moses. Secrets that the children of Israel, unfortunately, were not privy to. And that made all of the difference between Moses who knew the ways of God and the children of Israel who only saw his acts, who only saw his power, but really did not know the God behind the power. They saw the power of God, but they did not know the God of the power. In Exodus 30, we see God giving Moses yet another secret. They had seen God say, set bounds. Stay at the foot of the mountain. Don't come near. Because anybody who comes near God, because of the holiness of God, you... Israelites who have a lot of wickedness in your heart cannot come close to me and live. So for your own self-preservation, stay far. But in the midst of that, in the midst of the holiness and the power and the sovereignty of God, God was still showing Moses things that the children of Israel did not know. In Exodus 30, God gives Moses yet another secret. In verse 1, he says, You shall make an altar to burn incense on. And God tells him that that altar should be made of acacia wood. And then God goes further to tell him in verse, verses 5 and 6, that you shall put it before the veil, that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. God said, yes, I'm a God of justice. I'm a God of holiness. I'm a God of power. But I'm also a God of mercy. And if you put the altar before the mercy seat, I will meet with you there. I come in my mercy. I sit on the mercy seat. And that's where the altar is. That's where I will meet with you. I will come to you in my mercy. Because if I come to you in my power, if I come to you in my justice, no man can live. That Moses understood. Because Moses came to the place of hearing directly from God. Again, we see in Exodus 33, 
from verse 7 that Moses takes his tent. This was after the incident of the golden calf and, and the anger of God coming down and, you know, so many people dying in the camp. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp. He says, let me take my meeting place far away from the camp of these Israelites, these people that God has given to me. And he called it the tabernacle of meeting. And the Bible says that it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle, which was outside the camp. And so it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that the people rose and every man stood at his tent door watching Moses. So they would stand there watching Moses go into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered that the pillar of cloud descended, the presence of God came down and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people who came out of their tents stood there. They saw the pillar. They saw the presence of God. And they rose and they worshipped from afar at their tent doors in the camp. But there was Moses outside the camp in the tabernacle. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. And all of the Israelites were in this category of standing far with the exception of Moses' servant and successor, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man. And the Bible says that he also did not depart from the tabernacle. Moses came to the place where he could have conversations with God. Moses came to the place where he could have encounters with God. And in Exodus 33, we see yet another conversation where Moses says to God, you said to me, bring up these people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you have, and you have said that I, found, I have found grace in your sight. Now therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. Because Moses had seen the extent to which the people had angered God. And somewhere in his mind, he must have thought, hmm, these people, has God really forgiven us? Are, are we sure that God is not going to go on this journey with us only to kill us on the way? Moses wanted to be absolutely certain of the presence of God. He wanted to be absolutely sure that that fellowship, that intimacy that he was developing with God was not going to stop. And God said, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. And then Moses goes on in this conversation, this dialogue, like a man speaking, like a friend to a friend. He says, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't take us away from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? It is because you go with us that we will be separate and distinct from all the nations of the earth. It is your presence that will set us apart as a holy nation, as a royal priesthood, as a peculiar people. And the Lord said, I will do this thing that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. I don't just know you as a nation. I know you as a person. I have a personal, individual relationship with you. I have a face-to-face -face relationship with you. And you have gained personal revelation of me. And Moses says, please show me your glory. So from asking for his presence, from asking for his grace, he now takes it one step further. And he says, show me your glory. And then God says, ah, okay, I will make my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And then he puts a caveat in for Moses again, pointing to Jesus. And he says, but there is a place by me. You shall stand on the rock, speaking about Jesus. 
so that when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. That in Jesus, you will see me and live. Through Jesus, you will come into the law of liberty, predating the finished work of the cross. I will give you an experience out of time and show you what is to come. That through Jesus, in Jesus, you can see me and live. And then, God comes and he says, I am the Lord, gracious, merciful, abounding in mercy and truth. Even though I will by no means excuse the sinner, but I will show mercy, I will show mercy to generations of them that love me. That through Christ, you will have access to my mercy. Come to that mercy seat so that I show you that there is a way to navigate that brings you directly into my presence. That through Jesus, through mercy, because mercy has triumphed over justice, you can see me and live. These are the things that Moses knew that set him apart from the children of Israel. These are the things that brought Moses to the place where the psalmist said Moses knew the ways of God. But the children of Israel knew only his acts. And in Exodus 36, in 34, we see the Lord saying, write these words. According to the tenor of these words from verse 6, I have made a covenant with you and Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he received a second time. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the elders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, after the elders. And then he gave them the commandments that the Lord had given him a second time. And when Moses finished speaking, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And when he came out to speak to the children of Israel to tell them what the Lord had said. And they saw that the face of Moses shone. He would put the veil on again. This was Moses who had had an encounter with God. This was Moses before Christ reflecting the light, the light of God. What was happening with Moses was that the light of the countenance of God was reflecting on the face of Moses. Moses was bringing reflected light to the children of Israel. And that light was so bright that they couldn't look at his face. That light was so bright that they had to put a veil on. He had to put a veil on. And yet, Paul tells us, that there was something, there is something that is even superior to the brightness of the face of Moses. That there is something even better than reflected light which is available to us. When Paul was recounting this experience, he said that the glory of the old, the law which was fading away, was inferior to the glory of the new covenant in Christ. And he says in 2 Corinthians 3, from verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. The ministry of condemnation is the ministry of the law, the ministry of the Old Testament. Had a glory that shone in the face of Moses, in the light of God that was reflected in the face of Moses. But then he says that the ministry of grace, the ministry of the new in Christ Jesus, has an even greater glory. 
For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect. Because of the glory that excels. That there is a more excellent glory in Christ. That excels the glory of Moses and makes it not even glorious at all in comparison. For if what was passing away was glorious. What remains and endures to this day is much more glorious. Unlike Moses. Who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. So they were looking at Moses. And all they could see was Moses with their faces. Their minds were veiled. The veil on the face of Moses had a counterpart in the veil on their minds. And he says, until this day, that same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is only taken away in Christ. Because that veil is also the same veil that was torn in two when Jesus said, it is finished. Man has access directly into the presence of God. The kingdom of our God has now become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he will make his dwelling place, he will make his abode, he will make his temple, he will make his continuous place of presence with men. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We all, with unveiled faces, beholding, looking as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. He says that there is a mirror in the Word of God, because that Word is Jesus. And as we look into the law of life, it's as if we're looking into a mirror. And as we see Jesus, that light begins to shine in us. It goes from just a reflected light to a light that becomes indwelling in us. And so we have a greater glory. We have a greater light. That personal revelation allows the light of God to begin to shine on the inside of us. And it becomes not a reflected light anymore, but a radiating light. He says we are the light of the world. We carry the light of God on the inside of us. Because as we begin to look in the law of life, as we begin to look in the word of God, God, who spoke in times past, at sundry times in times past, unto the fathers by the prophets, has indeed in these last days spoken through his son, through the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. God and his word are one. Jesus is the word. And that word, as we look into it, takes on a life of its own on the inside of us. Sets going a light on the inside of us that begins to radiate, not just reflect. Moses was carrying reflected light. We are the light of the world because we are carrying The true light from God that is radiating from the inside of us. That is the power of personal revelation. That is the power of intimacy with God. That is the power of remaining in his presence, beholding his face and being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And the more we stay, the more we are transformed. The more we stay, the more our light shines brighter and brighter until the glorious day. For God, who commanded light to shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We look into the law of life. We see the face of Jesus Christ. There is a light from that face of Christ that shines in our hearts. And that's exactly what Peter, James, and John saw when they went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. He took them up and they saw Jesus transformed. Unlike Moses who went alone and no one saw him, who came back with light reflecting from his encounter, they saw Jesus transformed. They saw the more excellent glory. And Peter recounts this in 2 Peter 1, 16 to 19, when he says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables 
We weren't making this up. This is not some fairy tale when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him transfigured. We saw the light of God coming from the inside of his very being. Shining brighter than the sun. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the day star, the morning star rises in your hearts. John talks about the same thing in 1 John 1 verses 1 to 3. When he says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen it and we bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was also manifested in us, to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you so that you may have fellowship with us. We are in that place of intimacy and we declare to you that intimacy we have seen, we have heard, we have touched, we have handled. It's not something that we're telling you about because someone told us. It's something we're telling you about from our own experience. And we declare our experience to you so that as we have fellowship with Jesus, you may also have that same fellowship. And we're writing these things to you so that your joy may be full. My brothers and sisters, God has no grandchildren. God wants us to come to that place of face-to-face -face encounter. God wants us to stay in that place of face-to-face -face encounter where transformation comes, where the light of God goes alight on the very insides of us so that we may go around carrying a light that we are radiating rather than reflecting so that we may come to that place where truly we are the light of the world. We are like a city that is set on a hill. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for yet another opportunity to meditate on your word. Let it come alight in us, O oh God. Let it come alive in us, O oh God. Let it light a fire, an unquenchable fire that will consume us, O oh God, that will fill us with zeal and with passion for you. And that will cause us to go and stay in you and go and go and go until the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is our heart's desire, O oh God. And we ask that you grant it because it is in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh,